Our next speaker, is, who's going to join Dave on a panel afterward to do some Q&A, is uh, Dr. Franz Vollenweider. Um, he's going to talk about psychedelic 5-HT2A uh, receptor agonists, enhance mood and empathy, and reduce social pain in healthy humans, implications for mood disorders. So um, allow me to read his bio. Um, <clears throat> Franz X. Vollenweider is director of the Center for Psychiatric Research in the Department of Psychiatry, Psychotherapy, and Psychosomatics, uh, and professor of psychiatry in the School of Medicine, University of Zurich. His current research focuses on the foundations of the sense of self, emotion regulation, and social interaction that are relevant for human well-being and for the further understanding of mental disorders related to these domains. In 1999, he founded the Hefter Research Center Zurich and recently the Swiss Neuromatrix Foundation to support multidisciplinary studies into the mind-brain interface of pharmacological, for example, psychedelic, and non-pharmacological, for example, meditation, induced altered mental states. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters on the neurobiology of psychostimulants, psychedelics, and intactogens in humans. He's received the Achievement Award of the Swiss Society of Psychiatry, the Hefter Research Institute Award, the Goetz Prize at the University of the U University of Zurich, the British Association of Psychopharmacology Prize, and multiple awards from the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology, among others. He's asking me to stop, but it's your fault because you did so wonderfully. Anyway, I'll turn you over to Franz Wollenreiter. Thank you, Franz. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Neil, to be back here and uh, see all these nice people and great audience. Now, I want to go today not too much into details, but I want to uh, teach you or learn you a little bit about uh, concepts we use to understand uh, action of psychedelics in humans and uh, to go into processes. And we do that to have better markers for prediction, how people may respond, what is a trend in uh, medical science at the time. So, at the beginning, I want to thank all my Hefter uh, postdocs and students and uh, use some data from Michael, from Catherine, from Milan and uh, Reiner today. These are the master students, these are the heads of the different labs and all are involved in Hefter uh, studies. So, the second I wanted to thank a number of collaborators that we have, particularly in the US here at Yale, uh, University of Southern California, Mark Geyer is here from UCF, uh, University of uh, San Diego. We did a number of studies when we started 20 years ago. Then the main sponsors are Hefter, USONA and Swiss Neuromatrix, but we are also happy that we got a number of big grants from the Swiss National Science Foundation to support psychedelic research. So. Today I go a little bit first in concepts, then in specific tasks about emotion regulation and social interaction, and uh, we'll also come to some problems we have. So to start with, uh, we have objective measures to go into uh, the study of psychedelic states. We use a number of different brain imaging techniques like uh, fMRT, MEG, TMS EEG. So we have measures from outside as an observer. We can determine how these brain regions are activated or deactivated or how they interact over time. On the other hand, we have behavioral measures. This is not a co cognitive testing and often also emotional uh, responses or body responses, cognitive performance. So we call that the objective uh, third-person perspective, but we also use a lot of data through measuring the introspected uh, state some subjects have to respond or fill in rating scales or to interact and tell us what they experience. And at the top of that introspection or at that uh, experience is the self as a uh, construct, how we see the world from a certain perspective. Then we have thoughts, emotions and uh, so-called qualia. Now, it goes back to the 70s that Leuner in Germany did a number of bigger studies with psychedelics uh, into depression, and it was really impressive that he already in the 70s 
summarized a number of studies that showed that therapy-resistant depressed patients up to 60% improved after several moderate doses of psilocybin. There were then also a number of uh, larger studies and a meta-analysis of 40 studies about showed the same thing in so-called neurotic depression. This came out of the uh, nomenclature we had at that time mostly based on psychodynamic-oriented psychotherapy. But also anxiety was reused in such therapies. And Charlie Grob uh, in Los Angeles was the first and that showed about 2011 that one dose of psilocybin really remarkably reduced the anxiety and depression scores in depressed patients with cancer, terminal cancer patients, over six months. So that was a good beginning and a starter. Then, as you may have heard, two uh, fundamental important studies that has been done more recently and published in last December is the Griffith study and the Ross study, who showed that one dose or two doses, I don't want to go into details, reduce depression scores or anxiety scores over six months. That is really impressive. And that is important for, or gives us uh, a motivation to study the neural basis. What's behind that? How can it be that one single dose has such an effect? That's all against, we know, from neuropsychopharmacology with uh, conventional uh, antidepressants that uh, we have to give for weeks, months, and not even people respond well to such uh, pharmacology. So as a... Uh, Robin Carlat Harris has shown that in therapy resistant patients and depressed patients, one single dose reduces symptoms in about 70% over three weeks. Uh, what is the mediating factor of such reductions and what is the mediating factor of symptom reduction? So we differentiate two things. One is the state people are in and the other is the process. So when you look at these figures, there's a process over months and there's an acute process over days. So Leuner had the idea that a single dose of psilocybin or LSD alters the self. You go into a kind of regression, your self, other boundaries are more uh, loosened and you kind of uh, defense uh, mechanism is reduced and you also have uh, activation of personal relevant um, emotions and that was I think this was the best observation that uh, we nowadays use to make concepts there's an activation of personal relevant memories and that's mostly associated with imagery or symbolic optical phen phenomena based on the personal experience and life maybe archetypic uh, uh, phenomena, but that combination of emotion activation and recollection, sometimes also of memory and past memory, uh, is uh, a cornerstone in that process. Then the other thing was what already Leuner described was integration of the reactivated emotions or recollected uh, emotions as a part of the self. That was a typical language that psychiatrists used in the 70s, becoming from self, altered self, self-boundaries, defense, and so on. So how can we bring that into a more neurocognitive uh, concept? And i show you a little bit uh, of this concept that are used in, in the US and Europe for drug developments of, for instance, new antidepressants. So at the core, we have the self. It's a phenomenal, phenomenological space. It has seven aspects like ownership, mindness, nowness, I'm now here present. It's my body. I can be an agent. I can action. So these are concepts how we can uh, describe that self. It can be described from a philosophical point of view, but it's more from a functional point of view. So then there is the body between self and others. We have nowadays a lot of information from imaging, 
the what kind of networks in the brain may be responsible for enabling, I do not say cause the self, but enabling the feeling or the experience of, of a self. Self body is important, many people forget the body, and the self reference. So people think about themselves, they loop in negative loops as a, as a bias quasi, and this is on a meta uh, level. It's not triggered by outside, it's triggered inside. Increased self centeredness is a typical neutral formulation of depression. Everything goes about the patient itself or himself. And the other thing is uh, impoverished social interaction. So many people just study one brain, but the future is to study that brain with other people. And it's what we do in the lab. We bring different people together. We are a modern technology. Some people are in this calendar, others outside, and they interact. So I would say very simple, increased self-focus, decreased environmental focus in depression, and certainly a traumatic change in uh, negative emotions, hopelessness, uh, lack of pleasure, rumination that is thinking negative about oneself, so looping around suicidal thoughts, enhanced stress sensitivity. Some uh, uh, hints into that. So we have talking about this phenomenological space, uh, that's the self. On the other hand, we have external stimuli, like looking at the face, that triggers a certain activation in the person, in the brain, and this is generated without external input. So that's a, a huge differentiation when we do neuroimaging. We study brains and interactions in, uh, with the environment in resting state. The patient doesn't do anything, maybe eyes closed. And here he gets tested, for instance, memory task, emotional task, and so on. And as I said, what's the future is, this is just one side of the coin. We have to go much deeper into the interaction uh, of persons uh, in an illness with the environment. Set and setting is hardly studied with normal medications, for instance. It's coming out from psychedelic research. So what I also want to say, if you study performance or interaction with the environment, you uh, study specific cognitive or psychological domains like uh, affective regulation, affective re regulation, cognitive functions, social functions, and sensory motor interactions. These are quasi extrinsic induced activity patterns we can study. And the whole stuff in resting state is something quite different. Why is that so important? There are many guiding or guidelines from FDA, for instance, a very uh, interesting report uh, working into a personalized medicine. It's nowadays really important to integrate molecular research with clinical data to develop a more accurate molecular taxonomy of the disease. On the, on the other hand, to have a strategy. What are we going to to change, not just uh, giving the drug and observing, but how can we tailor that for a specific uh, kind of illness or a form of depression, and uh, finally for a certain patient. That is uh, what we want to go to, individual characterization of patients and treatments. It's a long way, but it started. So depression, as uh, a very simple neurocognitive model says, they have Depressed patients have a biased attention, a biased processing of thoughts, and a biased memory, all towards negative. That's our process. This is not the state when we measure the symptoms, it's how certain things work. For instance, you can then use certain uh, neurocognitive testing or emotional tasks, like looking at faces, positive, negative, neutral faces, measuring the EEG, going into a scanner, get readout markers, and trying to understand certain patterns. And with that, you already can characterize patients before they go into treatment. And then you give the drug and observe how these things change in parallel with symptoms, the biomarker has to give you information. Is it really a change on a biological basis in parallel 
with symptom reduction or even better with long-term changes like for instance Roland Griffiths showed that after six months people feel much more open. So we do the same stuff to go into the more details you heard from Dave with animal behavioral studies. I don't go into that today. So I can skip that. This is a typical uh, model here. We think that information from the frontal cortex does not really control the incoming stimuli, this negative stimuli for instance, seeing negative phases to certain brain structures. So there's a bottom-up information coming in on the top-down control and in fact when you look in depressed patients frontal areas are not that active here like in controls and on the other hand, centers like the amygdala, who are responsible for emotion processing and anxiety, are not that much, uh, are much more activated and not uh, that much deactivated like in, con in controls. So there's an interplay between frontal areas and incoming stimuli and the amygdala and such loops we can approach with this kind of techniques and do that for every patient uh, because we do that repeatedly. So another approach we did uh, some years back to 12, uh, sh showing faces, uh, pay, uh, happy faces, neutral, angry faces, measuring, re uh, recording brain uh, waves. This is about a third of a second. You got a signal and a signature for this kind of processing. The most interesting what we did is because ketamine came out so much and everybody wanted to do ketamine. So we compared ketamine versus uh, psilocybin. Uh, we showed the pictures non-conscious, people saw positive negative faces, but uh, did not really be aware of it. And we showed them a little bit longer uh, and they became aware of what they see. And there's a kind of uh, a similar activation pattern in brain regions that are important for emotion regulation. But what you see is that psilocybin reduces the response to fearful faces. This is the, the reduction. Neutrals are more or less not statistically different and happy are not reduced. But ketamine reduces fearful and uh, anxious inducing uh, uh, faces. It uh, also somewhat similar, like here, not really statistically significant, neutral, but also reduces happy faces. So this was the first hit. We said, okay, psychedelics are much better than ketamine. I don't know, uh, uh, not uh, make somebody uh, upset here, but uh, it's an observation. So. And what I have shown, uh, the happy faces are processed. Um, the, the fearful get changed. So, go to the next. Then we wanted to go deeper in. This is a uh, processing of uh, emotions induced by faces. We used a number of other stimuli. And uh, Rainer Kremer used all these so called IAPS pictures, not a really high dose, about 50 milligrams of psilocybin, control pictures, and found, in fact, that right amygdala is much less active under. Uh, psilocybin and parallel with an increase of acute experience symptoms. So we had asked, as Dave said, is it the 2A receptor that is stimulated by psychedelics first or is it what we know from animal studies, a top-down effect on the frontal cortex and glutamate release? Is there more glutamate release in the frontal cortex? Than other questions. And in fact what we found that uh, frontal areas get activated by uh, psilocybin, the amygdala gets reduced and this is uh, in parallel, as a, this is coordinated as functional connectivity be between the reduction of the amygdala, the more it gets reduced, the more the frontal higher uh, single cortex areas get activated. So there's a really an interaction of these two. In depression we have a loosening of that interaction, so the amygdala is not that much controlled as a center of fear. So that was a nice approach to that. Then we did um, other uh, interesting tasks like reading the mind uh, in the eyes task. You have you, you show people such faces and you ask them is it uh, surprise, angry, hate, anxiety. They always can choose one of these words and you 
do that a hundred times with all different phases and we found that psilocybin really reduces uh, the uh, it enhanced the recognition of positive emotions but reduced uh, the uh, recognition of negative. There's something going on in the brain also in contrast to expression, face expression. And then uh, Michael Comet used words, positive and negative words, and neutral words, and could show that the reduction also in, in, a, in a cognitive emotional domain, it's, you have to be aware of the word, is dependent on 2A receptor activation. Did that with EEG. So then he wants to go ahead. Uh, Catherine Preller had asked, how is social interaction? Uh, do psychedelics? It's a more real-world approach. Uh, what's going on when people interact with the world in psychedelics? We did uh, neuroimaging before people went into the scanner, a lot of uh, baseline measures, then psilocybin. Then when they were really towards the peak, we put them in the scanner, uh, measured them again over time. We looked also at spectroscopy, where we can measure glutamate release, aspartate, GABA release, in parallel with the activation pattern. And people did then also empathy task, moral decision making, and, and so on, when they came out of the scanner. This was not new imaged. So interestingly, the person plays with two others in a real uh, simulated game. And what we see when you get excluded, you don't get the ball. Sometimes they play together, he doesn't get the ball. Then you have so-called uh, activation of regions in the anterior cingulate and not more orbitofrontal cortex here or on the end dorsal ventral lateral cortex that's so-called physical pain signal it's very interesting when you get hurt you have the same uh, areas get activated is it physically or get you excluded in in a task and what was the most interesting that people felt less excluded on the psilocybin based on a rating scale after each trial. They had to evaluate how much they felt excluded. Uh, we did also control questions that they really understood and were attentional here. And the activation in the pain regions was reduced with psilocybin. This was very interesting. Then the analysis of uh, a few minutes later then after doing that task of the glutamate, aspartate, and all the different transmitters we were interested in, we found that the reduction of the pain signal correlated with aspartate. So the aspartate and glutamate, they are uh, coupled in a so-called uh, shunt uh, biochemical function. We don't know, we expected glutamate, but we found aspartate. Now we have to understand that a little better. And on the other hand, the reduction of the pain signal was also coupled with being more connected, with more uh, in a united state or in, in unity. The other very interesting finding is that depressed patients, they have a reduction in empathy. They cannot so go into uh, other persons, but uh, psilocybin increased emotional empathy uh, explicit and implicit, the two forms, and uh, but not cognitive empathy. Cognitive means you see a picture and you think, how does this person feel? And emotional empathy is you go into this person and are a part of his feelings, we really interact. It's quite a difference. It was really interesting to see that psychedelics. Uh, change that emotional empathy correlating with the alteration uh, of the meaning of perception. Meaning is a very uh, profound thing that psychedelics can alter the meaning or shift the meaning. It can be, be more meaningful uh, or altered in, in different ways. So to go to the last step uh, about outcome, longer effects, we studied the impact of a certain uh, cognitive control that is trained in mindfulness training. The core of mindfulness training is certainly emotional flexibility, attention, uh, the people uh, exercise over years, sign bodies, for instance, and cognitive flexibility is what people do, then the non judgmental awareness, and then they have another behavior, physical well-being, mental well-being, depending on their capacity of the core processes. 
So to study the impact of uh, cognition and emotion regulation in detail, we did four retreats with uh, Zen Buddhist uh, experts that had more than uh, about 6,000 hours of meditation at least, 20 years, almost all the same, the same school of Zen, and it was possible to do that with the help of uh, my friend Vanya Palmas, who himself is a Zen master and runs a center in the Swiss mountains. So we packed the whole lab, went up. Uh, it was not easy, but here you see the wonderful uh, Pilatus and like of Lucerne. We were up here completely alone for seven days. Um, these Zen Buddhists have trained in a retreat. They were not allowed to speak. They did all their mantras in different forms according to the teacher. They uh, had known that kind of praxis. And you see a little bit in that wonderful sandal made of completely of wood and ab absolutely silent. And here we measured every evening the meditation depth with rating scales. We were interested in the state they uh, acquire over the daily eight hours of meditation. And they four, half of them got double by control to placebo, the other one got uh, psilocybin. And we had always in a retreat five psilocybin plus uh, five placebo. Ten were enough to observe and to control. And we did imaging before and after. And in a second round of retreats, we do immediately uh, each during the session, uh, during the session sitting. This is it's a more complex study. We wanted to know what's really going on in that deep meditation with psilocybin. Then we did uh, after three months and six months, we do control with different rating scales like life changing inventory or persistent effect questionnaire from Roland Griffiths. And we're asking what's going on here. And what we found is a tremendous uh, feeling of connected, being connected, we call that uh, unity in our scales. Uh, spiritual experience was up to 70, some 80, this is standard error, 90%. Uh, blissful state, also some imaging here. Don't want to go into details, but the question was, what are the predictors? We did a number of psychological ratings before, like absorption, depth, they have lifetime mystical experience with uh, rating scales, cognitive uh, control, how they control their thinking, emotional control, can they really accept their emotion, or are they just cognitively controlled? That's a very important difference. And uh, meditation depth, as I said, and the meditation status. And what we found that this oceanic, uh, let's say, selflessness or boundlessness was mostly driven by psilocybin by meditation depths over the three years, which increased a lifelong uh, mysticism experience. Visionary uh, experiences like this here this, uh, were mostly dependent on psilocybin, meditation depths, and absorption. How good they can absorb is a specific task for that. And then the other side was anxious ego dissolution, loss of ego boundaries, not oceanically and positive, but with anxiety, uh, depended mostly on the dose of psilocybin, together with other data we have, and how good they can accept their, information, uh, their emotion as a part of themselves. So here emotion comes in also in terms of how you can get open up and get rid of your boundaries. And uh, this was a first uh, detailed uh, insight, and what you see here, the other half of the group, these are 20 and 20 subjects, they didn't go deeply into uh, an altered state in terms of oceanic boundlessness. It's quite, quite nothing, 20% about. We were really asking, what's going on here? They trained for years and stay there. And here you see the lifetime mystical experience. Here the placebo group in, in the retreat, and here is psilocybin. Psilocybin really propels people into that state. So it's, it was the most, uh, in terms of variance uh, explanation, uh, most important factor besides emotion, emotional acceptance. But here we did another thing. I analyzed here uh, 
age and sex matched controls that had the same dose like uh, the psilocybin people in the retreat. But they come only up in these measures, for instance, blissfulness up to 50-60%. There's something in with the long year training. We just do a control uh, uh, experiments with uh, beginners. So, and the outcome that I was mostly interested in, what's driving the outcome? And uh, used here a, a mystical rating scale from Hood, which has introvertive mysticism, extrovertive, and uh, interception, uh, interpretation. And you see the most driving factor for well being measured, the changes of well being of the three months, here are the details, was driven by sacredness positive uh, affect, how people that interpreted, how they could integrate that, and the feeling of unity. We were very surprised it was nothing uh, driving all the changes based on uh, loss of space and time, ego loss as a kind of self, how you go, and ineffability. This was, was a, a thrilling first uh, look into what's driving. And I think it's interesting because uh, the term interpretation of the mystical rating scale says it. It's how good you can make sense of the experience. As making meaning of the psychedelic experience is tremendous important for that uh, long-term effect. Now, let's skip that a little bit. Just wanted to show you when we blocked the 2A receptor because psilocybin, DMT, and LSD, and we showed that for LSD and DMT, and uh, Jordi Riba did that for uh, DMT, uh, we showed it for psilocybin and LSD recently. There's something secondary to the activation, that's glutamate release, and this glutamate goes to AMPA receptors and triggers neuroplasticity. We think that on the long run, something is going on here for the changes after six months, and activation of NMDA glutamatergic receptors uh, fosters learning and memory. So, combination of psychedelic experience and a certain therapeutic strategy will certainly enhance long-term effects. So, I'll go here and just here to show two uh, data for closing uh, the presentation. We uh, speculated, based on animal studies at that time, some years ago, that psychedelic stimulate serotonin, um, similar like ketamine, uh, glutamate goes up, stimulates NMDA receptor, AMPA receptors for learning and activating neuroplasticity via BDNF. That has been shown in rats. And the Really interesting thing is if you give rats that have been conditioned for fear, after the conditioning a little bit of psilocybin or another two antagonist, you have a very fast extinction. That is uh, how they react to fearful stimuli, these animals. And if you give psilocybin, it's, it's very fast reduced uh, the response to fearful stimuli. And more recently, it has been shown that, in fact, 2A agonists enhance associative learning. That means if you do a kind of new experience in the psychedelic states, certain brain systems get activated that are responsible for making connections between the experience and your memory. So it's not just lost under something of that single day. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Hi. So thank you so much. What an amazing talk. Uh, the, the correlation of chemistry and behavior. Extraordinary.